that you've had a prosperous week, meaning that God has used you and you saw your prayers answered this week and uh, we're able to enjoy uh, being uh, a saved, born-again Christian for this week without uh, too much difficulty. <laughs> Obviously, there's a lot of it. Uh, you can see up here this morning that we're looking at eclectic textual criticism. Now, Kaylee came in, she says, I think you spelled that wrong. It's supposed to be electric. Uh, no, electric, that's what she said. Uh, so... Uh, don't get confused by the terms. We are going to try to explain this today. And I think it's really important. Uh, most Christians have no knowledge of this uh, whatsoever. Very few pastors do. Uh, but it is an important issue. And we want to educate you about it. Because it is the foundation of our first statement of faith. Which is we believe the Bible is a final authority for life and practice. And uh, that is a first tenet of what it means to be a Baptist, te technically, the acronym of Baptist. The first one is that, uh, biblical authority. We believe the Bible is the final authority for life and practice. But it must be studied and interpreted correctly. That's hermeneutics. And then we must, uh, of course, uh, use a, we must interpret it from the right text. And uh, how many of you have ever heard of the downgrade cross controversy? Anybody? <laughs> the downgrade controversy started in England. Although it began with liberalism, it came into the Baptist Union in, in England, especially in London. And uh, what happened in the downgrade controversy is it began to downgrade doctrines. And otherwise erode away at the things that were accepted for centuries by Christianity. And, of course, there was considerable opposition to the downgrade philosophy. We know it as liberalism today. Um, of course, naturalism, uh, religious humanism, which then developed into secular humanism, all of this is downgrade. We call it the slippery slope of compromise today. And when you start on the slope of downgrade, it never really ends. There was a young preacher uh, saved out of a Methodist church, a little backwater Methodist church, uh, who led in the opposition against a downgrade controversy. He had no theological training, no uh, unless you were an Anglican in England, you couldn't go to college and be trained. And uh, so he didn't have any theological training. And he led this downgrade controversy uh, in its opposition. And his name was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And uh, he started preaching without any education other than being able to read, write, and do arithmetic <laughs> uh, at the age of 17 years old. By the time he was 19 or so, I think he took the uh, London uh, Tabernacle, Park, Park Street Baptist Church uh, in London. And, of course, he filled the place to, so full they kept building on and couldn't do it again. And, uh, you know, we're, we're meeting in places, to, preaching to crowds to 8,000, 10,000 people. And much of that was because people did not want to believe the liberalism. And so they were flocking to hear him preach because he stood against these things which were flooding the Anglican Church, were flooding the Baptist Union. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, there were some other problems uh, with uh, Brother Spurgeon, but uh, I, not, not that I would make any big deal out of any of them. I think he struggled in his own beliefs between rationalizing and struggling with uh, controversy between uh, Calvinism and Armenianism all his life as well and probably landed a little more so on the side of sovereign grace than he did on anything else. Kaylee? I just now, like, Spurgeon was so wise, like how in the world someone like that, I love He 
know what I mean? Like, you're so wise. Like, how in the world can you be so wise? And like, so God doesn't mm-hmm. even understand. Yeah, you, if you really read Spurgeon, he really wasn't what people claim him to be. Of course, he was a famous preacher, so they tried to take him under their camp, but he struggled with that. You can, if you read, and I've read everything Cal, or Spurgeon said, read all, I have all of his, all of his books, and, uh, well, all, most of them I would imagine, but, uh, uh, if you read his, especially his sermons to, uh, preachers, young, because he taught a lot of young preachers, uh, You'll find that he really struggled with, and many of the things he says is con- contrary to what sovereign grace teaches. So, well, let's get back to this because this is really the heart and soul. This is when what we know as higher criticism, lower criticism, eclectic textual criticism. This is where it was all birthed. But most people today, when it comes to dealing with these issues, they have no knowledge of it. I put something up on Facebook this week to ask a question about this whole issue. And it's amazing the answers that you get. I didn't get much response to it. Because most preachers, they avoid these kind of conversations <laughs> like the Black Plague. But uh, uh, because they know that it's just going to be a debate. But it doesn't have to be a debate. There's a foundation for uh, the truth of God's word. So we begin off here this morning by asking the question, why do you use the Bible translation that you use? Uh, if you cannot give a biblical and intelligent answer to that question, you are what is we would call a Bible translation agnostic. And of course the word agnostic simply means what? I don't know. <laughs> and uh, that is essentially what many people are. I find out that a lot of people who use the right translations are as equally agnostic. They don't know either. They make a lot of assumptions that probably, I appreciate their assumptions, I appreciate where they've arrived at, but if we're going to have to defend this position, which is our responsibility, we have to help other people come to the right solution then we have to have the right apologia. And that is apologetics, otherwise the ability to give the answers to the reason, apologia, that's a Greek word there, of the hope that is in us. So undoubtedly most people sitting in the pews of local church know nothing of the issues of any kind of, of textual criticism or even what these terms mean. And most people assume that the Bible they hold in their hands, whatever uh, is whatever their authoritarian leadership tells them it is. I don't want you to choose a translation based upon what I believe. I want you to choose a translation based upon what you believe and give you the foundations of understanding uh, and, uh, you know, the, the historical understanding and biblical understanding to make the right choice. So most people sitting in the church pews do not want to listen or read about these kinds of topics because I had one guy say this, that makes my head hurt. And they make, and they they find them boring. uh, You know, in in teaching this at a a, a conference on Bible translations in the King James Bible one time, I had a pastor come up and he said, Brother Ketchum, you make my head hurt. You know, but, you know, For a pastor, these are the kind of things you should be able to explain. So I'm going to try to take a very complicated issue today and make it simple enough for you to understand. So for this reason, these pew sitters will live their lives as puppets manipulated and deceived by people that they deem to be authorities on the subject that are too deep for them to comprehend. Look, if I can understand it, you can understand. Uh, I I thought about bringing all the books I've read on the subject just to impress you (laughs) that uh, I've I've done my work. It would pretty much fill up that uh, Lord's Supper table about this high uh, with the the things that I've I've read on, not, you know, on both sides of the issue, 
But I, I, I've come to realize that most people don't care about any of that stuff. They either trust what you're going to tell them or they don't. And so I'm not here uh, to do anything but to show you how I have come to the conclusions I have come and how I've come to my faith in the translation that I use uh, and believe is the word of God. So authoritarians, on the other hand, depend on ignorance for maintaining their positions of power over the ignorant. And for those in modernist liberal churches, their Bible is simply a guidebook for life, and because their authoritarian leaders have taught them that the Bible is just a religious book full of myths and historic fairy tales. And, of course, the downgrade in all of this, how, how this has slipped from where it originally began in the issues of higher criticism and lower criticism to where it is today, uh, you will not find very many people who actually believe the Bible is the Word of God. And that has to be our first area of persuasion if we're going to persuade people to be saved and trust what the Bible says about the doctrine of salvation. So most Christians, most professing Christians, do not even know what modernism or German rationalism are. They simply know these terms as liberalism. And they certainly do not know that uh, how modernism and German rationalism have shaped the cultures of Europe and, and the USA. In Europe, it would be difficult for you to find genuine believers. That's what the, what the downgrade philosophy has done in Europe. Most of the old churches, whether they be Lutheran or Anglican, have been closed and bought up by Muslims and turned into mosques throughout Europe. We're seeing the same things happening here. We're usually about 20 years behind Europe. And, of course, Europe is usually about 10 or 15 behind, years behind um, the Norway and Sweden who lead uh, Belgium. They, they lead the pack in liberalism. Geneva. Switzerland. So these were all birthed. Now, what we know today is liberalism, socialism, and even Marxism were all birthed in the European institutions of religious education captured by German rationalism through what is known as classical education. Liddell, uh, who was, who, who first began to mention the issues of long periods of time. And of course introduced into that then, although his theory was uh, from unbelief, uh, he introduced this in and Christians began to pick that up and out of that came the long day theory. And there was a young man who read Liddell uh, in a seminary in Germany whose name was Charles Dar Darwin. He was being trained for the ministry. And of course we all know where that has gone. That is what a classical education is. In the classics of German rationalism. I had a group of homeschoolers one time on the internet were talking about, uh, they were Bob Jones proponents and they said we want to return our children to a classical education. I said do you know what a classical education is? <laughs> and uh, they said well it's all the classics. I said, yeah, the classics are all, almost all philosophically Plato, Aristotle, um, and of course German rationalism, all of this philosophical nonsense that has came in and driven Christianity. So classical education is philosophical, not biblical. But classical education has captured Christian education, even in most Bible colleges. Certainly Harvard and Princeton, uh, Brown University, which was a Baptist university. So modern textual criticism, what we know as eclectic textual criticism, cannot be separated from unbelief. Now, what, are they, what is their unbelief? They don't believe the Bible is inspired. They don't believe the Bible is preserved. Um, and that's all propagated by German rationalism. 
So the foundation of German rationalism is the Bible is not inspired. Uh, it is not the, every word is not the inspired words of God. And the words are not preserved in any Greek or Hebrew text, certainly not in any English translation. That is a downgrade. And it downgrades in different levels. And so you can come into Christianity and you can find every level of downgrade. For instance, um, the uh, seminary, uh, based, uh, Fourth Baptist Seminary, uh, doesn't believe the Bible, many of the professors there, most of them, and the book that they've written there, produced out of Central Seminary, says we don't believe the Bible is preserved in any manuscript or any Greek manuscript, any, any group of Greek manuscripts. And... Um, that's their book. I think it's called One Bible Only. I have it in my library. So we have all kinds of downgrades of this. And you, you can go in and you, you, you'll talk with people and have this conversation. And we assume, well, you know, they don't believe like we believe. But then if they don't believe like this, uh, us, then they have to be way over here in unbelief. Well, there's all kinds of levels of unbelief. That's a downgrade philosophy. And the downgrade philosophy never uh, ends. I mean, you take one guy here and another guy here and another guy here. You get everybody to accept a variable, variable level of downgrade. So the word modern is connected to modernism, which simply defined means unbelief regarding the verbal plenary inspiration of the words of God. So when you're talking to a person who calls himself a modernist or a postmodernist, they do not believe, they have an unbelief regarding the verbal plenary inspiration of the words of God. Otherwise, every word in the Bible is chosen by God and put within a syntax of structure, of language structure, Hebrew or Greek or in Daniel, of course, uh, Arabian. We have Aramaic. Uh, we have this Greek syn or this syntax is there. And that is equally inspired. It's also inspired in regard to what it says in regarding history and regarding science. It is always accurate in all of those areas. That is, it is infallible or without error. Now, downgrade philosophy began to attack this at every level. First of all, the verbal plenary inspiration, they began to say, well, it's not the word, but the ideas. And to the place where, no, it's not inspired at all. And we have six basic levels, but within that downgrade of areas of inspiration, we have all different areas of downgrade. So come here to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Here again, Paul is speaking to Timothy. Now a very experienced veteran. So I know pe people are saying, Paul's speaking to young Timothy. Well, he's not young anymore. He's he, he been around a long time. But he's a generation that's going to be left behind after Paul is killed for his faith. And he is telling Timothy, you carry on now where I'm leaving off. So he says, of these things, put them in remembrance. So all the things that he ta taught them charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. Otherwise, keep the main things the main things. Don't get drifted off into nonsensical arguments about how many angels there are on the head of a pin. Uh, what does that do? That subverts uh, to the subverting of, uh, of the hearers, of the faith of the hearers. Otherwise, that's a misdirection. And then he gives this command, study to show up. Thyself approved unto God. Why? Because you're the one. God's going to hold you accountable for what you do. He's not going to hold you accountable for what everybody else does. But he is going to hold you accountable for what you do. So study to show thyself approved unto God. But a workman, this is a priesthood of the believer, that needeth not to be ashamed. Why? Because you studied. And what, what was the result of that study? You rightly divided the word of truth. And that is the battle. 
downgrade that minimizes all of that. You know how much it breaks my heart to hear Baptist pastors uh, say, oh, you don't need to really study. Just get up there and let the Spirit of God lead you. Boy, that just breaks my heart. Because I've listened to some of that stupidity. And that's really what it is. Just utterances of stupidity. They, they speak to vain, jangling words. Because I think they like to hear themselves talk, but there's no substance to it. Uh, you know, how can somebody talk for 45 minutes to an hour and not say anything? You, you all been there, right? So what is study here? Study is the application of the mind to the acquisition of knowledge. As by reading, investigation, and reflection. So what is, what is Paul saying to Timothy? Study the scriptures. Why? Because in that study you are making an application of your mind to acquire the knowledge and the wisdom of God. And you're going to do that by reading, by investigation, comparing scriptural things to scriptural, and by reflection or musing, meditating upon what God has said. Now the word study here, 2 Timothy 2.15, from the Greek word spadadzo. Not, it's not a spud, but I always remember spadadzo because it sounds like a potato, you know. But spadadzo. It means to use speed, to make effort, to be prompt, to earnest, to give due diligence, uh, endeavor, labor, and then we get the word study. And the intent is, you know, the primary prerequisite to giving the study of the word of God, its proper priority and diligence, is the first aspect of genuine faith, known as autopisticism. Otherwise, I accept the Bible as the final authority uh, for life and practice. It's a guidepost for me, a light under my feet. Uh, and, uh, you know, for my pathways. This is not the reality within rationalism or modernism. Rationalism sought to liberate theological thinking from the miraculous and the supernatural. Therefore, the word liberal equals naturalism. Liberalism the move, is a movement to liberate from what? To liberate you from the word of God. Because when they can liberate you from the word of God, you can be controlled. So most people using the word liberal do not understand this etymology. Etymology is the history of the study of words and where they come from and what, they, what their original meanings are and how they've evolved in, over a span of time. So do you believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures in their original languages? Okay, everybody here says, yeah, we, we do. So if you say you do believe in the verbal plenary inspirations of the scriptures in their original languages, can you explain that uh, belief to others with exactness? Do you know what each of these words mean? Verbal, plenary, inspiration, preservation. Do you know what these words mean? If you know what these words mean, you believe these words, and you believe what these words mean. So therefore, if you understand and believe what these words mean, you should be able to explain to anyone who asks you what they mean. Right? So the word study is connected to the command of 2 Timothy 2.2. And what is that verse? The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit. That's an imperative mood. Otherwise, that's a commandment of God. Just as much of a commandment as thou shalt not steal. This is a commandment of God. Commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. How do you make someone able to teach others? You teach them fully. What you teach deeply, they can explain simply, but it requires an in-depth explanation. 
First Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Here Peter now uh, dealing with some of the same thing Paul dealt with as he comes to the end of his life. He says, but if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Who's he talking about? All those who are opposing him. And all kinds of oppositions. Originally it was a Roman Empire. Originally it was the Jews. Then it was the Roman Empire. Uh, later on it would even become many within Christianity. The Gnostics opposed them. They had all kinds of opposition. They were being killed by everybody. Nobody liked the Christians. Not because they were bad people, but because they stood solidly and wouldn't compromise. And then Paul made, or Peter makes this remarkable statement in verse 15. He says, but sanctify... Again, imperative mood. What is an imperative mood? It's a commandment of God. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready. Again, the imperative mood comes carries through this whole sentence. Be ready always, always be ready to give an answer. That's that word answer there is apologia. Or a defense of your beliefs. To every man that asketh you of a reason. What's that mean? Why do you believe what you believe? So Peter is talking here to the church now. He's saying this to every one of the people in the church. He says, you are to be ready always to give an answer, a defense of what you believe to every man that asketh you of why you believe what you believe. And you're supposed to do that with meekness and fear. Not in a haughty spirit. Otherwise, your ministry is a ministry of persuasion. And persuasion is, uh, is, is the, the medium. The medium of persuasion is always the truth. So, from these foundations, and now we move off into some truths here that I think we have to understand. The corruptions of rationalism and modernism are birthed from the corruption known as deism. There are two basic definitions of deism. Now the vast majority of people today who say they are Christians are actually deists. Number one, belief in the existence of a God on the evidence of reason and nature only. Have a problem with that? With the rejection of supernatural revelation. Otherwise it distinguishes them from theism. What is supernatural revelation? That's the word of God. So the only way you can believe in the existence of God. Is through reason. In nature. What is another word? What is the big word for a person who only believes in nature? A naturalist. So a naturalist doesn't believe in supernatural. So, uh, of course, supernatural revelation of God. So you have to, if you are a deist, you have to reject the Bible. Unbelief. The second. Belief in a God who created the world but has since remained indifferent to it. So deism thinks God is like... Uh, he started creation off, he threw the bowling ball down the alley, and he has no control over it, or wants to have any control over that ball after it leaves his hand. That's deism. God's not involved anymore. Now, we know many scriptures that uh, say contrary to that. God knows what the numbers of the hairs on your head, right? He is involved in the intimate details of your life. But how do you avoid that? You want to be a deist. Why you then have to abrogate the word of God. And you say, well, the only reason we have any belief in God is not by the Bible, but by reason in nature. What we can see in empiricism. Talking to a young uh, a man who, uh, his brother asked me to visit with him. and I, I, he, he was saying, well, uh, yeah, that faith, I, I want to see. I want I want you to prove to me that God is. Then God doesn't work that way. <laughs> I said, uh, everything about God is you accept by faith. You're in the darkness right now. And the only way you can know anything about God is to believe by starting off by faith in his word. 
If you can't start there, I can't help you. You can search for faith all over the place. You'll look, be looking for it for the rest of your life and you'll not find it. Because faith in, it begins and ends with faith in the word of God. So again, these two definitions of deism establish the fact that modern textual criticism, what we know as eclectic textual criticism or textual reconstructionism, all three are the same thing. What are they? Modern textual criticism, eclectic textual criticism, or textual reconstructionism all mean exactly the same thing, all originate from the presupposition of unbelief in the verbal plenary inspiration of the words of God. So this developing dynamic of unbelief led the development of naturalism regarding textual preservation. Inspiration and preservation. Textual reconstructionism takes supernaturalism out of God's preservation of his words and says it's just by natural means that we preserve the word of God. And so they are by natural means reconstructing because they do not believe God has preserved it. Now, you say, well, that's just liberals. No, there are people who call themselves fundamentalists who believe. So this developing dynamic of unbelief led uh, the development of naturalism regarding textual preservation. And naturalism means there was no supernatural actions by God to preserve his word. But it doesn't say God would preserve his words through the processes of naturalism. God would preserve his words. God's going to do it, and what God does is a supernatural work. Now, how God does it, I don't know. But I believe, and God says he's going to do it, I believe he does it. So it is my responsibility to search out and evaluate where that preserved words of God are. So for the naturalist, God's word is preserved only in heaven. And you ask him, well, where is God's word preserved? Well, God's word is preserved in heaven. <laughs> you know, I have a hard time when people say that, I say, I want to say, are you an idiot? I mean, what would be the purpose of God simply preserving his word in heaven? God is God. In heaven, there's no error. There's no, uh, you know, there's no heresy. The word of God is there. He is the word of God. The purpose of the preservation of the word of God is for us. So, God's preserved only in heaven and not. Now, there are numerous levels of those believing in natural preservation. Like I say, I believe, quite frankly, that uh, the position of a Central Baptist Seminary is a natural preservation position. I don't believe the Bible is preserved in any uh, text or Greek text or group of Greek texts or manuscripts, uh, and they believe in textual reconstructionism. So they're willing to use practically any translation they think is accurately translated. So, preservation versus reconstructionism. Okay. What is that? It is supernaturalism versus naturalism. Now, write that down. When somebody talks to you about, well, I don't, I don't believe that uh, God has preserved his Bible in any text or any group of Greek texts. Uh-huh then you can say, well, what you believe is reconstruction. You're a reconstructionist. So by nature of being a reconstructionist, you're a naturalist, not a supernaturalist. Now we can co conclude that anyone involved in reconstructing the Hebrew and Greek text through a textual criticism is by that identification a naturalist when referring to a pres preservation. So modernism introduced two different forms of criticism into Christianity that corrupted Christianity at almost every level of theology. Now remember, we're talking about downgrades. So they entered in two downgrades into Christianity, right? They brought it down. So what is, first one is higher criticism. Higher criticism means higher what lies above the text or outside of the text. So higher criticism, also known as historical criticism, seeks to put the Bible text into the historical context in which it is derived. Now, we wouldn't have any problem with that. Fundamentalists would have no objection to this if this is all that higher criticism did. 
But very early in the development of higher criticism, the methodology was captured by the liberals of German rationalism. And these individuals began questioning the inspiration of the scripture, otherwise above or outside of the scripture. Scriptures claim to be inspired. But they began to look at them above or outside of the scripture. And such questioning always begins with doubt and ends with unbelief. And that is what happened to thousands and thousands of people across Christendom. And especially those being trained for ministry. They came into the seminary believing uh, fully in the Bible to be the word of God. And eventually that was eroded. And the liberal institutions of every denomination you can imagine, including Baptist. And there are various levels of downgrades in that. So they question the authorship of each book of the Bible. They question the historical accuracy of the Bible. Uh, anything that seemed miraculous, they questioned that and had to find a natural explanation for it. So their natural explanation of Moses parting the Red Sea was that Oh, really, they just went over on this little narrow part over here, and uh, the water's only about six inches deep over there. We know uh, that's what God did there, he parted that, and, and uh, which I've always said is even a greater miracle, but God, God drowned the whole Egyptian army in six inches of water. So their conclusions, and that's the issue, were that much of the Bible was simply myths and exaggerations, naturally. Um, we can give you all kinds of names of these guys that did that. So that's not important. Uh, they're all dead anyway. And most more than likely in hell. So beginning with unbelief in the inspiration of the Bible, the critics of higher criticism began to attempt to destroy faith in the accuracy of his, of his history recorded in the Bible and the accuracy of the science recorded in the Bible. And it opened up all kinds of flood gleats in the downgrade. So these corruptions of higher criticism have become acceptable views of most professing Christianity in the 21st century or liberalism. Even within fundamental institutions, we have the Schofield Reference Bible, and I've used the Schofield Reference Bible all my life. But he has a uh, um, gap theory which allows for Millions and millions of years in creation, or allows for creation. So what is the Christianity of the 21st century? Well, it's not Christianity at all. It's called liberalism. Then we look at lower criticism. Now, that what lies below the text. So in most part, higher criticism was completely rejected by Bible-believing Christianity or fundamentalism. Remember, the downgrade philosophy was the early foundations of fundamentalism. Fundamentalism began in the late, mid, early 1900s, downgrade in the late 1800s. But it was a precursor to the development of what we know as theological fundamentalism. Historical and biblical fundamentalism has always existed. It's just believing the Bible. So, however, lower criticism was not equally cast aside as was higher criticism. And as a result, many within the more conservative of evangelicals and even many fundamentalists gave ear to the arguments of lower criticism. Many began to accept textual reconstructionism and reluctantly new translations that flowed from the never-ending changes within the reconstructed Greek text. And so they would come out, well, that's not really too bad a translation, or it's a pretty good translation, or it's easy to understand, never even thinking, at least I don't see this discussion going on, that it comes from a completely different Greek text. It's not the same. Let me give you just a really simple principle here. The things that are different are not the same. Duh. The things that are different are not the same. They're two different texts. Now that's where we get into eclectic textual criticism. We probably won't get there this week. We'll look at it next week. Yes. Yes. 
Well, it's corrupted. The text, many portions of the text are changed or the, the language of the Bible is changed or absent. Now we could spend a lot of time showing you, you, you can do a little research, just look at some from different translations. Most of the time, if you have a different translation, even in some of our modern, like I use a Schofield Reference Bible, the Schofield Reference Bible, especially in the new Schofield Reference Bible, uh, but the old one has it too, will say, this text is not in most manuscripts, the best manuscripts. What they're saying is, that's not in the text that they're translating from, or they're using as their Greek text. And there are a number of those Greek texts that uh, are there. But the received text, it's in those. That's a majority text. The text that those are translated from are called Alexandrian texts. And if, if you, uh, anybody ever seen a copy of the Sinaiticus text? About this big. Brother Brown had one here. You seen one? Yeah. Well, I'm going to have Brother Brown back here again one of these days. But uh, uh, in the Sinaiticus text, you can see notations all over the place. And I personally believe that those are the marks of origin. Not not or, or, origin, but origin was a uh, Arian, didn't believe in the deity of Christ. And I believe he, uh, even according to Eusebius, a great uh, historian, says they were changing the text all over the place. And those two texts, which are the foundations of the what we know as the eclectic text today, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, are two very corrupted texts. So there's a lot of what we know is in the received text, not in those texts. And that's what they're referring to, these so-called scholars, are saying, well, this is not in the best manuscripts. And you're translating, otherwise the translation that you use coming from a different text, from rather than the preserved text. It's a received text. There's a little text for criticism in the received text, but those are spelling changes, and we'll talk about that a little later, but how, how that happens and what's going on. But yes, in uh, fact, uh, really, the King James Bible is the only Bible translated from the received text. Some will say that they are, but then in the margins, of the Bible, they will use references to the collective text, say this is not in the best manuscript. So what is your foundation of, of belief? They say this is not in the best manuscript. They're saying, I don't believe in the received text, although I'm translating from it, I don't believe in it. Uh, and therefore, the best manuscripts here are this. Now, what does those translations, what is the goal of those? Uniquely, it doesn't necessarily there are portions of scripture that are eliminated, but I have found an investigation that two major doctrines, probably three, are attacked. First of all, the deity of Jesus Christ. Those areas are weakened. What is called the Johnian comma, Johnian comma, and uh, otherwise there are three in heaven, the Trinity of God. Um, so the deity of Christ. Uh, the second one uh, is, of course, the um, uh, baptism, those baptism as a ordinance of sanctification rather than salvation, those texts are corrupted. And then the third one, of course, is the issues of the Lord's Supper. Again, the ordinance view being changed for sacramental view of Scripture. So these things are, are, are the areas where the Scriptures are weakened. So now you can come to the Scriptures when these texts are weakened you can come and bring your suppositions in there and they're not dogmatically overridden by texts which say, well, no, that can't be because this text contradicts that completely. So it weakens the text. So does that answer your question, Karen? We'll, we'll spend a little more time on that probably next week. But, uh, so here we come now. Lower criticism quickly morphed itself into eclectic textual criticism which is another animal altogether than textual criticism. So, um, lower criticism originally looked at the extant manuscripts of the Bible available at the point of time in history 
and sought to establish the accuracy of those apographs based upon certain principles of evaluation. Apograph is a copy. We have no originals. Otherwise, we don't have the original book written by the Apostle Paul. We have copies of it. And uh, I've written a lot of books, and you go back there, and you find the first printing, and the second printing, and the third printing, and the fourth printing, and the fifth printing are all exactly the same, unless I change them. And so it is true in many cases. But sometimes there are scribal errors. And so you went back to various ways to check scribal errors. Maybe you changed, you didn't write one letter accurately enough and it could be misinterpreted as another letter. Obviously, if we take uh, uh, the word DIP and we change the word I to L, it gives another meaning, doesn't it? So uh, it could be those things. But we can check against translations, early writings of the church uh, fathers, if we want to call them that, uh, because almost all of the Bible is completely quoted in the original languages in their, in their writings. And we can go back to some of those. So lower criticism, and Lurgy looked at the extant manuscripts and uh, uh, certain principles of evaluation. But the most basic premise of lower criticism is that because there are copyist errors in the apographs, the copies, therefore they assume God has not preserved his words in any manuscript. <laughs> now, that's an assumption, isn't it? And of course, that's not the case. Uh, there may be a preservation of God's word in a group of manuscripts that require just a little bit of checking and a little um, work to check against the errors. And of course, that is what textual criticism did. And uh, there are some differences in different manuscripts. Most of them are very basic and, and uh, were easily found and discovered. <clears throat> so, I'll give you this, and I think we'll close with this this morning. In basic textual criticism, most of the principles of criticism are very factually objective. Otherwise, we, we know exactly what they are. Also, among most involved in basic textual criticism, there is a presumption of faith in the verbal plenary inspiration of the words of God. And... The fact of faith in God's promise to preserve his inspired words. And these two principles of faith are not generally true of those involved in eclectic textual criticism. In fact, the opposite is true. In basic textual criticism, most of the copyist errors are spelling errors and can be simply corrected by checking them against quotes from first century writings of early Christians where most of the New Testament Greek text is quoted word for word. Another checkpoint is uh, exceedingly early translations of the Bible, such as the Arabic, Arabic translation known as the Peshitta. That was in the second century AD. And so only extant text in alignment with most of the text are used in evaluating the correctness of any reading. So in basic textual criticism, ancient texts with wide diversities in readings are given little to no credibility proportioned to the degree of their diverse readings. So if you find a really, 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 really old text, but it's never been used, it's probably because it was not, not accepted as, a, as, a, as an accurate Bible. And so we'll pick up there next week. And any questions or other comments you have this morning? Going slowly, okay, on purpose. And we'll spend, you know, a month or so on this, but I want you to grab it. So you have some questions, write them down. Because <clears throat> I want you to be ready to give an answer to every man that will ask you of the reason of the hope that's in you. And uh, be able to answer these questions. Now, most people don't want the answers today. Somebody asked me, what, what translation do you use, Pastor? And I said, well, do you want the long answer or the short answer? And uh, they said, well, we want the short answer. I said, I use the King James Bible. And then they said, why? I said, oh, you really do want the long answer. 
But after I started on the long answer, they didn't want the long answer because it takes a long time to get the long answer. Usually in a couple of hours, but you know, even to get the highlights. Because you, you look into somebody and you start giving the long answer and you see the blank stare in their face. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Most people don't. Yeah. 